Today our focus is on nurturing our prophetic voice. Um, James Luther Adams was a uh, probably one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent theologian in um, UU faith during the 20th century. And he made a statement that congregation, prophetic congregations are places where people make history instead of being pushed around by it. Hear that one more time. Prophetic congregations are places where people make history instead of being pushed around by it. No one can argue with the fact that we are living in a difficult time in our history. So what a simple assessment test for our congregation at the UUCC. Are we making history or are we being pushed around by it? I read a quote recently of someone um, describing their experience after reading the newspaper, and I'll share it with you. After a while, you become aware of nothing but a culture of feeling, of dark days, of schism, evil for evil, the common destiny of the human being getting thrown off course. It's all one long funeral song. Sounds modern, sounds very current for us, but that was actually a quote from Bob Dylan in 1962. Out of that space from reading the newspaper in the New York Library and that space of emotional uh, pain and darkness that he was experiencing from all that was going on, he wrote a song called A Hard Rain So Gonna Fall, which invites us to open our eyes and see, and especially invites us to speak and name what we see. Dylan knew that remaining silent implied complicity in the evil injustices of his time period. So what did you see, Dylan writes? And one of the things he said that he saw were 10,000 talkers whose tongues were all broken. Many of us have recently felt compelled in light of current events to name that we are ending our silence. And I guess the question as we think about our voice and our prophetic voice and our ability to speak in our culture is to ask, how did we get muted to begin with? For the very literalist today, that question is easy. We can say, well, Phil did it. He's hosting the Zoom meeting. He muted us all. But maybe to use Dylan's metaphor, how did our tongues get broken? There's a Canadian therapist, an author, and speaker by the name of Vince Scalman who writes about how our voices can get silenced, building on some of the work he did in his book, Let the Fire Burn, Nurturing the Creative Spirit of Trill Children. He shares many ways our voices get silenced and that silence get manifested in our daily behavior. At some point in our lives, we maybe made the decision that it was no longer safe to speak truth. In your early years, speaking up led to a scolding from parents or worse. Their censure caused pain and engendered a belief in you that speaking up would create even more pain. This belief compelled you to withhold and question your voice from then on. Your parents, of course, did the best they could given their challenging upbringing, but whether they knew it or not, they were recreating their painful past, a past where they were to be seen but not heard or forced to cope with their difficulties and feelings by keeping a tight lip and not rocking the boat. The cycle repeated itself in how they raised you and in how they expected to keep certain parts of yourself invisible. Even if your parents were generally kind and open, so long as they held on to their need to withdraw, which was their coping strategy, they might have intentionally, unintentionally invited you to withdraw as well and likely inherit fears and beliefs and attitudes. Withdrawing our voice serves a purpose to protect ourselves from being hurt and alienated, ostracized. So long as we play by house rules and not rock the boat with endless questions and rational imaginations and childhood, childish antics, we are safe. But the need to withdraw in childhood perpetuates into our teen and adult years when we continue believing that we need to protect ourselves. The childhood belief crystallizes into an attitude and behavioral patterns that ingrain themselves in our psyche and our lives. We go from needing to withdraw as a child to being withdrawn as a teen and as adult afraid of our voice and our fear of getting hurt. As we think about peeling away the various ways that our voice gets silent and manifests itself, 
Gaumann gives us lots of ways that that manifests in our everyday lives. We can become the go-to person where we take on things for ourselves, or we become a person that can't say no, or the person that says, I'm going to be good and behave and do things by the book, or we become afraid of conflict. We might devalue our ideas and our opinions or feel unsafe to share, even in a close community. Some of us move inward and have a relentless inner critic that has this strong voice that judges us constantly and tells us to be cautious and tells us that if we speak, people will move away from us. Some of us become unnecessarily apologetic and we doubt our self-worth and feel that it can be swept away if we speak our voice and lose the connection. So when we peel all of that away and we begin to kindle the fire that we were born blazing deep inside ourselves, we are faced with the truth that our voice is profound. That fire needs to be fanned and needs to be nurtured. Our voice needs to be heard. Our voice has the ability to make history and not just be pushed around by it. Our voice is prophetic. Resident linguist Don Cooper helped me this week and offered some insight on the origin of the word prophetic Ultimately, understanding it as the prophet, as one who is a spokesperson for truth. Our fourth principle calls us to be a free, to a free and responsible tr uh, search for truth and meaning. And I believe that a responsible search for truth involves being willing to be a spokesperson for that truth. It's not enough to be aware of injustice. We must speak, speak up for justice. The UUCC must be a place that encourages, empowers, and nurtures the prophetic voices of each member and friend. Nurturing your prophetic voice may cost you something. Doesn't mean that the world will always be appreciative and accept you with open arms. It can be costly. Friends and family may reject you. School board members in our state learned this week that it can cost you your job. Too many prophets throughout human history have learned that it can cost you your life. Sometimes nurturing your prophetic voice means that you are forced to choose between being in relationship with yourself and being in relationship with neighbors or colleagues or coworkers, and maybe even family and friends. And most importantly, it may put you in conflict with being friends with Facebook friends. I believe that relationships are one of the most important thing that deserve our energy. But if someone is uncomfortable with your voice, with you speaking your truth, and makes you choose between them or yourself, you have to choose yourself. In those moments, you cannot abandon yourself. You cannot abandon the oppressed. You cannot abandon the web of existence around us that needs our voice to speak up for it. We cannot abandon our principles. And at the same time, when we speak out against the injustice that we see and experience, the faces of ignorance and hate around us, we also cannot abandon our principles. I don't know about you, but I've been wrestling lately with our principle that says that we recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And as I wrestle with this particular principle, the conversation that I have with that principle kind of looks something like this. I say, every person? <laughs> yes, Stephen, every person. Even the ones that make my blood boil? Yes, that person too. Even the ones who per perpetrate violence and hate and murder? The ones that I find morally repulsive? Yes, Stephen, every person. All right, we got the every person down pat, but really these folks have dignity and worth. The one that I just said was a worthless human being. Yes, Stephen, you're wrong. Dignity and worth, every person. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> the principle reminds us that behind the behavior that we experience as undignified and dishonorable is a person of inherent worth and dignity. So nurturing our prophetic voice demands that we don't forget that as we speak out against injustice, 
we must stay connected to who we are and what we believe. Dr. King reminded us that we cannot become the beast to defeat the beast. There's a Zen story about a man riding a horse that is galloping very quickly and another man standing alongside the road yells at him, where are you going? And the man on the horse yells back, I don't know, ask the horse. You and I are in a situation that we cannot pass the question along to the destructive path of our culture we are riding. It is time for us to pause and let our prophetic voice be heard. The therapist that I referred to earlier, Vince Galvin, uh, writes a beautiful invitation and I wanna share his words as we wrap up today to claim our prophetic voice. He writes, Every time you authentically and courageously speak up, you love yourself a little bit more. You give yourself the love your family could not give you and you reclaim your right to be heard, valued and respected. Being seen and heard is your inherent birthright. You are not meant to live in the constraints of your mental cave, rather you are meant to be wild, free and expressive just as young children are. This free spirit, this child still lives in you. It has never left. It wants to come out and play. So open the gate through the beauty and the power of your voice and let yourself be seen and heard once again. In this congregation that you and I call home, may we find the courage and the comfort of like-minded peoples to be able to let our voices be heard in the culture around us. Let us be a people of talkers whose tongues are not broken. May the UUCC be a place that is not pushed around by history. In this crucial time we find ourselves, may we find ourselves and make history.